Hello, BookTube. Grammaticus Books and I are at it again. <laughs> we are once again flexing our BroTube muscles. We did a couple of head-on collisions when it came to science fiction movies. First, movies adapted from books, and then movies that weren't adapted from books. And we had a blast. Uh, and as you know, if you've watched Grammaticus' channel, or if you've watched mine, we're both of us just dripping with testosterone. So we decided the natural thing to do after those science fiction movies was war movies. What are the best war movies? Hmm? Uh, and we, I, we, 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 Pistols at Dawn, we decided we'd post our videos of the be the 10 best war movies. Uh, he'd make his list, I'd make mine, no conferring with each other. And uh, I have a list of movies that I want to share with you here, and we'll, we'll see what you think of it. I have 10 movies and an honorable mention. And a lot of my movies revolve around the same war. But not the first one. <laughs> the first one is The Invasion of Granada. The first one is Heartbreak Ridge, uh, 1986, directed and starring Clint Eastwood, uh, which is a, a postcard to war. It's a recruitment thing of a type. It's not as bad as Top Gun, but it's, uh, it, it is one side of the scale when you're dealing with war movies. The two big sides of the scale will either be uh, that war is a refiner's fire, a force that gives us meaning, of what, that war is something from which good things can be extracted, or war is utterly dehumanizing, utterly barbaric to everyone in any way, not just in terms of what of gunfire. You're going to get those. It's two sides of the coin there is for what you're going to do, and for this. Uh, Clint Eastwood decides to give you the first side. This is a, this is a, it's a cheering war movie. It's a war movie in which, sure, there's violence, but the, the esprit de corps element, the, the band of brothers element is supposed to be more meaningful. Of course, the band of brothers element is a quote from Shakespeare, from King Henry V at Agincourt, but, uh, but it's, its own esprit de corps saccharine syrup was undermined by the great miniseries Band of Brothers, which is uh, pretty cynical about war and pretty pretty open-eyed about it. Although even that miniseries underscores that it, this will this will bring men together, that it's a bond that will be unbreakable, uh, and that is what is celebrated in Eastwood's movie. It's it's pretty good entertainment, uh, and he this was the last I think the last major role that he did. Certainly the last major role he did under his own direction that did this sort of thing. He then moves to the other side. His his great Western movie is very much the other side of considering Westerns. There's nothing celebratory about it. Uh, but we'll move on. We'll move on from number 10 to number 9. Number 9 is Platoon. Uh, 1986, Oliver Stone. Oliver Stone is, uh, how do the kids say it? Bat crap crazy. <laughs> but he is, can be, a very effective director. And in Platoon, he is very effective. You will feel yourself caught in the mire of war, in the random violence of it. And with Platoon, we moved to Vietnam, and uh, we're largely going to stay there for a lot of these choices, because uh, the particular uh, there was a particular time period in movie making that just could not stop thinking about Vietnam. Uh, the, a lot of the directors who had been involved in Vietnam in one way or another, who had been scarred by it in one way or another, had finally reached the point two decades later, where they could command production budgets, where they could direct helm a movie, a major movie. And so you get, you get these things. Same thing with our next choice. Uh, my choice number eight is Full Metal Jacket from 1987, directed by Stanley Kubrick. Uh, who I, uh, I'm learning a lot about Stanley Kubrick from, uh, from hunkering down with a big biography of him. And Full Metal Jacket is, <laughs> it is, it is a perfect example of the other side of that, of that spectrum, of that scale, the dehumanizing effects of war. That's what Full Metal Jacket is all about. It's about how people go insane when they come in contact with war or the war mentality. And how, by the end of the movie, the ones who aren't going insane, the ones who aren't unhinged at all, are the ones that you find the creepiest. They, it's, it's not the lunatic who snaps and, and kills somebody. It's the people who are, can laugh at this and just become dehumanized killing machines without any trouble at all. 
it's a, I hate to give it to Kubrick, but when he deserves it, he deserves it. It's a terrific movie and deeply disturbing, uh, deeply disturbing. Then number seven on our list is Hamburger Hill, John Irvin's novel or uh, movie from 1987 which is uh, it's more boys adventure it's a little bit it's a little bit seedier certainly seedier and certainly more morally ambiguous than Heartbreak Ridge but uh there are large parts of it there are parts of it that are dark very dark but there are parts of Hamburger Hill that read almost like MASH goes to Vietnam I think I, I think they work very much so I think I worry that that probably uh Hamburger Hill and maybe one other movie on this list are in the greatest danger of being dated. And I don't know how many people will have, will have seen it or will like it. There are some pretty good performances in it, though. Uh, then we'll move on to uh, uh, movie number six, which is the big red one. Uh, Samuel Fuller's direction from 1980. Uh, that is complex and extremely disturbing, <laughs> but also conventionally acted. There's a lot of a lot of old conventional Hollywood scene stealers, mostly in the B level, uh, that that come into this thing and do a really good job. They give it a lot of heart. Uh, in terms of uh, the big Ren one, is is it's more concerned than a lot of these other movies are with the the lasting grip that war can have on people, even from war to war. That it it, it doesn't let go of you. You, you, it ha it's, it's something that happens to you and it changes you. It's not someplace you go and then you come back. As any of you will know, if you are veterans, or especially if you have veterans in the family, older veterans in the family, you, you don't just go there and come back. It, you go there and something happens to you, like getting a disease. Uh, then uh, our, the next one, number five, is 1989. It's Casualties of War. Uh, it's Brian De Palma and Sean Penn. So I should hate it, <laughs> but I don't. I don't. It's brutal. Absolutely brutal. Uh, it is very much on the other side of the scale that we're talking about, where the, the absolutely base, bestial dehumanization of humans when they're in contact with war, when they are suddenly given a weapon with armed men behind them under their control, and a civilian population in front of them that is absolutely supine. A civilian population in front of them that is helpless. Some of whom are fighting back. In in Casualties of War, we see that drive a character insane. Character might have been gruff, an a-hole, but we see it dri drive that character insane. Just as we do, actually, with uh, Peter O'Toole's character in Night of the Generals a couple of decades earlier. We see that happen and you feel it. You really do. Uh, Casualties of War, because, because it's Brian De Palma, it's full of overacting. He not only didn't control that on his set, he seemed to encourage it. <laughs> but, uh, but nevertheless, it's pointed overacting. I, I, it, I think it's it's pretty rewatchable. If you're in a grim frame of mind, you can definitely go on a palate cleanser when you're done with it. Uh, then this next one, maybe it would count as a palate cleanser. I'm not even sure that it counts to be on this list. I'm stretching the point. Uh, it's, from, it's from 1985. It is Ron by Akira Kurosawa. And... I, I know that it's not explicitly just solo a war movie, but it is military. It's extremely military. I think you'll see that when you watch it. You, If you've never seen it, Ron, you will be amazed. You will just be amazed. It is visually astonishing. And it's it's based on the story of King Lear and the the the, the three son his three sons in this case have to fight for what they want and they have to fight him and it is a very martial movie it may be a bit of a, a technicality here to put it on this list but i couldn't leave it off because i think of it as military uh, then we'll move on to number three and if if ron is uh is getting another technicality then number three might be just illegal <laughs> well i didn't know i had not watched grammaticus's own video on the subject i'll leave a link to it down below it's excellent but I had not watched that video before I made my own list. And in that video, he said he's not including miniseries. <laughs> well, who knew? <laughs> I did not know that. I went straight to Boris Segal. I went straight to 1981, the miniseries Masada. I don't know how many of you would be familiar with it, uh, but it's it's this, it's definitely military. It's, it's, it's the Roman army. It's the 10th Legion. But they are up against... Well, at one point they are called bandits, but it is pretty, pretty, fairly well organized Jewish guerrilla resistance after the Romans destroy the, the Great Temple in Jerusalem. 
uh, they they are set to stamp out guerrilla resistance, military or otherwise, all throughout Judea, and that resistance concentrates on the the mountaintop fortress of Herod the Great, uh, Masada. A, a group of Jews pull up there, and it's almost unassailable, they think, and they are confronted with a Roman legion, commanded by a character played by Peter O'Toole, and. It's amazing. I, I cannot sing its praises highly enough. It is amazing. Amazingly done. Amazingly quotable. I could quote a huge chunk of Masada to you right now. I have, indeed. The, what, there is there is a, a, a speech that the Roman commander gives when he is quelling a rebellion in his own ranks uh, that I gave on this channel once. Just, I was very, I was, I was mock upset at something and I just recited his speech about, gentlemen, hi, there is, there is a mutiny or there isn't. <laughs> So it's fantastic. If you ever get a if you haven't seen it, and you ever get a chance to see it, you should. It is beautifully, beautifully done. Uh, and then we'll move on to 1989 and to the American Civil War. Glory, Kevin Jarvis' uh, movie Glory about the American Civil War and about the heroic regiment of black soldiers led by Robert Gould Shaw during the American uh, the American Civil War. There is a beautiful monument to Shaw's regiment here in Boston, at the top of Boston Common. I'd be happy to show it to you the next time you come to visit. Uh, and the movie is tremendously good. Uh, it's got uh, uh, Denzel Washington and Matthew Broderick plays, plays Robert Gould Shaw. And uh, there's a bit of an in-joke there that I don't think even he is aware of. And Morgan Freeman. It's wonderful. Hard to do. Hard to watch. It doesn't gloss over the, the equivocal nature of those black soldiers. Not at all. It doesn't gloss over that at all. Really, really good, and with two uh, little set pieces. One right at the beginning of the movie, and then the, the big fight set piece at the end of the movie are both extremely well done. So I, I definitely put it on here. And then my number one pick, <laughs> I don't know, I'm, I'm risking trouble with, my, with Chromaticus books here, but my number one pick is a war that hasn't happened yet, and it will be the last war. And it's, it's 1983, it's Nicholas Meyer, and it's the day after, which was a TV movie. But I didn't think that I didn't think that was disqualified. Maybe it is. I didn't think that was disqualified. It's a TV movie about nuclear war, the immediate aftermath of nuclear war. What happens in the immediate aftermath? It was it may even, for all I know, still be the most watched program in television history. It's uh, sobering. It's well worth watching. It is. It is really interesting to watch. It, it is rewatchable. Uh, but it's not. It's not Doctor Strangelove. That, that's for sure. It, it shows what this would be like from you on the ground. What would what would be like if you were in traffic when this happened? If you were at home when this happened, and you managed to live through it, uh, and it's it's really really good. It's really good, and I think it counts as war. It wouldn't uh, full scale exchange won't happen by accident. Uh, so there you go. <laughs> Those are my best war movies of all time. There's only one more that I want to add as an honorable mention. <laughs> it also is a war that hasn't happened yet, and it is perhaps the most rewatchable thing on this list. I hate to say it, but perhaps it is. The first half of Full Metal Jacket is infinitely rewatchable, but and Masada is incredibly rewatchable. But it's a huge investment of time. To do it's a long miniseries, but my last movie, <laughs> uh, it's 1984. It's John Milius. It's Red Dawn. <laughs> it's it's Red Dawn. <laughs> it's it's a, a war movie about the Russians paratrooping into American towns and cities, about war between Russia and America that is not nuclear, where can the Russians steal a march on America with conventional forces. And they just start paratrooping into town. And they, you need Patrick Swayze to save you. I, it's an imaginary war, but it's still a war movie. <laughs> I'm still, I'm still going to count it as a war movie. So there you go. That's my honorable mention is Red Dawn, which is uh, a lot of fun. And, and definitely at least paramilitary from beginning to end. If I can include Masada, which I don't know if I can or not. But if I can, I can certainly include Red Dawn. Uh, so there you go. That is war movies. Uh, and what will Grammaticus Books and I do next? I have an idea. I will propose it to him, and if it's okay with him, we'll be back with dueling lists in no time. <laughs> Thank you, Booktube. <laughs>